Professor Claire Bumbra from the Newcastle University. Claire, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Claire Bamber. I'm Professor of Public Health at Newcastle University, and I'm also a senior investigator in CHAIN, the Centre for Global Health Inequalities Research that Terry has just uh, talked about and outlined um, our aims and objectives. And recently through CHAIN, um, we've involved in thinking about the interaction of COVID-19 and health inequalities, and I'm going to give a short presentation uh, talking about how the COVID-19 pandemic has been an unequal pandemic. So I'm going to start off by sharing some international data about some of the emerging evidence of uh, social and economic and ethnic inequalities in COVID-19. I'm then going to talk about how I think we can understand this in terms of a concept of a syndemic pandemic. I'll then talk through some of the pathways where we think we are getting these inequalities, where they've arisen from in terms of inequalities in COVID-19. And, and then I'll, I'll draw some conclusions towards the end. So I'll start here with outlining some of the data. And here on the left hand side, you can see data. This is from the United States uh, from April this year. The United States had a very quick and quite deep uh, first wave of the pandemic. And this is analysis by Nancy Krieger from University of Harvard where she has plotted the percentage of people living in a county in the United States in terms of the percentage of people living in poverty. So we can see here, less than 5% of people in a county live in poverty. So that's below the federal poverty line. Um, compared to up here, you've got over 20% of the population in that county living in poverty. And here on the y-axis is the COVID-19 death rate per 100,000. And what you can see is that in the areas that are have the lowest poverty rates, so, so the richest um, areas, and the mortality rate in April was around 10 per 100,000. In contrast, in neighbourhoods where you've got over 20% of the people living in poverty, many of which these neighbourhoods are also um, very much uh, mixed ethnic background, then the rate is almost double at over 19 deaths per 100,000. On the right hand side, this bar chart is showing similar data from the United Kingdom. And this is plotting neighbourhoods, so smaller level geography of around 3,000 households. And it's, it's comparing the relative rates in terms of the least deprived to the most affluent neighbourhoods compared to the least affluent to the poorest neighbourhoods. And we can see here again, a relative risk of over 100 in the bottom 30% of neighbourhoods in the United Kingdom. So again, similar to the US data, we can see here for the first wave, that the, 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 the rates were around double in the most deprived communities. And just by way of example from the United Kingdom, here's some data from um, Scotland, which is showing that in the what we're calling the first wave in the United Kingdom, which runs from March through to July 2020, then the COVID-19 death rate per 100,000 was 86 in the most deprived 20% of neighbourhoods um, compared to 38 per 100,000 in the least deprived. Next slide, please. So we can see there just examples from the United States and the United Kingdom about neighborhood level inequalities in terms of, of people's deprivation. Some of our data also shows inequalities at an individual level, looking here in these bar charts at occupational status. So for both men and women, again, this is data from early in the pandemic, we can see that people in more elementary occupations, working in factories, and also in kind of caring and retail and leisure services have much higher mortality rates from COVID-19 than people who are office workers and professionals. The kind of gradient is slightly steeper amongst men than amongst women. And we can also see here significant difference in mortality rates between women and men across all of the different occupational groups. So there's area level inequalities based on measures of deprivation. There's an individual level economic inequalities based in terms of people's occupational background. Next slide, please. And this is also, again, data in this case from England showing inequalities and a big important and high profile inequality within the United Kingdom that COVID-19 has drawn attention to is inequalities in terms of black and minority ethnic groups. And this data here on the top is for the diagnosis rate, so confirmed cases um, amongst different ethnic groups. And on the bottom here is the mortality rates. And what you can see is that for black British men and women, their diagnosis rate is almost three times as high as for, for, for white British. 
And if we look across at the mortality rates from this early wave, then you can also see much higher rates, particularly amongst black British men compared to white British counterparts. So there's evidence already from the first wave of the pandemic of geographical inequalities, occupational inequalities, and ethnic inequalities. And of course, these intersect in terms of um, people from black and minority ethnic groups, for example, are more likely to work in particularly vulnerable occupations and are more likely to live in more deprived neighborhoods. So there's an intersectional element to some of these inequalities as well. Next slide, please. So as part of some work that I did uh, as part of CHAIN, I wanted to explore theoretically what some of these pathways might be. Why are we having these inequalities in COVID-19? As Terrier pointed out in his presentation, we know a lot about health inequalities from an educational perspective when looking at chronic disease, but we've also found similar patterns now in infectious disease in high income countries. So I draw on some work by Meryl Singer. Now Meryl Singer was an anthropologist and clinician um, who wrote this idea of a syndemic, uh, talking about his research that he did in the 1990s in urban areas of the United States. He was examining the epidemics of HIV, substance misuse and violence. And he argued to the medical profession uh, in the United States that instead of treating them as separate epidemics, if we deal with HIV on the one hand and then we'll deal with substance use on the other, he said you need to think about them as interacting and mutually um, enforcing. And he said they came up with the idea of a syndemic. So rather than thinking of just one epidemic, you need to think about how they interact with one another. And I think this provides a useful frame for us when we think about how inequalities in COVID-19 have emerged. It's emerged because it's a syndemic of inequalities in the social determinants of health represented by this diagram on the right hand side. A syndemic of inequalities in the social determinants of health have then collided with COVID-19. So we get inequalities pre-existing the pandemic, for example, in housing, or education or work environment have then interacted with COVID-19 and led to inequalities in COVID-19. And in turn, we then need to think about how COVID-19 itself might re go back and exacerbate those structural inequalities, for example, through the emerging economic crisis in Europe and how that will impact on health inequalities into the future. So the syndemic pandemic is a way of thinking about health inequalities and COVID-19 inequalities and how they intersect. Next slide, please. And so we can think about using this concept of the syndemic pandemic and drawing on our wider knowledge as in the public health community about the social determinants of health and think about at least four pathways through which we've ended up with these inequalities in COVID-19. The first one is around groups of people from more deprived communities having an increased vulnerability to COVID-19, to adverse effects. So we know there are certain clinical risk factors such as diabetes or COPD, cardiovascular disease. And if someone has that, then they're more likely to have a severe case of COVID-19 and more likely to require hospitalization. And this is more likely in deprived communities because they already have a higher burden of disease from non-communicable diseases from these clinical risk factors. And of course that relates to the social determinants of health outlined here on the right hand side and people's unequal exposure to conditions such as unemployment or poor housing and how that's increased their chronic disease, which in turn then interacts to exacerbate um, their COVID-19 outcomes. So that's the first pathway. The second pathway is around increased susceptibility. And this is looking at how people's immune systems, how strong they are and how able they are to withstand and fight off an infectious disease. And some of the, uh, the explanations of why there might be inequalities in COVID-19 between men and women talk about differences in men's immune responses. And I think there's an argument that can be made that uh, different immune responses can be happening in different groups because groups that have been more exposed over their life course, because we are largely talking about older groups that are experiencing adverse outcomes, they have a, um, a lower immune response because it's been weakened, for example, through exposure to high levels of chronic stress and raised cortisol levels. We won't go into too much more detail, but I'm happy to discuss it more in the questions, but it draws on the psychosocial theory of health um, as outlined by Michael Marmot and Richard Wilkinson. So there's increased vulnerability, increased susceptibility, and the third pathway is around increased exposure. 
And one of the key things here is when we look at working conditions. So, for example, if we think about the lockdowns that happened across a lot of Europe in the early part of this year, then many people, professionals, etc., were encouraged and able to continue working from home. But key workers and many staff in, in, who are working in factories, in food production and so forth, had to continue going into the office, going into their workplaces, using public transport often. So clearly their exposure to the virus is much higher than people who are able to socially distance within the home. There's also issues, for example, around whether people are able to self-isolate. And this in turn relates to different social protection systems across Europe, which I suspect Caroline will mention in, in her talk later. The fourth pathway is around increased transmission. So this relates to inequalities in housing conditions and in the neighbourhood. So for example, if you live in a small house, perhaps it's overcrowded, you have less rooms um, than, than you might need. Then if one per member of the family is tested positive, you know, has a positive case of COVID-19, then it's much harder to protect the rest of the family. And this has been particularly important in the British context in terms of black and ethnic minority groups, because often they're living in more overcrowded urban environments, but they also have multi-generational households. So if a younger member of the family who's going out to work comes home with COVID-19, it can very quickly infect older members of the family with very severe um, consequences. So we think that the syndemic, the pathways to inequality are at least fourfold and they draw on people's different experiences in the past of the social determinants, but also currently their exposure to social determinants during the pandemic. So that was just a short overview of the work we've been doing in CHAIN on this topic. And so to conclude, I think we can think about health inequalities before COVID have ended up resulting in an unequal pandemic. We know the outcomes are worse in less advantaged groups and communities, and we can see this across data from a number of countries. We've argued that this needs to be understood as a syndemic, the combination interaction of non-communicable diseases, social inequality, and the social determinants of health. And in order to protect ourselves and vulnerable communities into the future, we need to take more long-term action on reducing inequalities in these clinical risk factors. And if you want to read more, then the chain publication is listed here. And you may also have seen that we have an infographic launch today that provides a user friendly overview of this work. So thank you very much for your attention. And thank you to Terrier and UNESCO for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you so much, Claire, for your uh, excellent uh, presentation.